So today I thought I would um, try and set this mode of practice within the framework of, um, so kind of it's a framework of levels of consciousness that Sangrachta gave. And this was in a talk in the Higher Evolution series called How Consciousness Evolves. Talk 83, if you're interested. <clears throat> So he gave this towards the beginning of the High Evolution series, and he is very definite that um, evolution, that, the, that spiritual development, is one of consciousness. That's the sort of primary way of, um, as it were, talking about um, spiritual development. So he says that you can't actually define what consciousness is because it's not like anything else. Um, but you can talk about different levels, if you like. So he talks about four different levels of consciousness. He talks about simple consciousness or sense consciousness, about self-consciousness or subjective consciousness, he talks about transcendental consciousness or objective consciousness. And finally, the fourth level is absolute or universal consciousness. So he gives these four levels. Now, I'm not going to recapitulate the, the talk, but you can check it out if you like. But I'll talk a little bit about the first three. So the first level of simple or sense consciousness, this is what we're probably familiar with from buddhist psychology if you like this is where um, consciousness and a sense object and a sense organ come into contact and so you have this moment of simple consciousness of sight consciousness or ear consciousness or whatever it is and this we completely share with the animal kingdom and then the second level, which he talks about as self-consciousness or subjective consciousness, this he calls, and I don't know if it's still believed to be true, but he calls this un, um, particular to humans. So this is where we, um, it's very difficult to talk about this, isn't it? But this is where we, as it were, bring awareness to that sense consciousness. This is where we know that we know this is reflexive consciousness. So there is a knowing of the knowing. And of course, this is what we're trying to develop in everyday mindfulness practice. We're just trying to be present, be present to the sense consciousnesses that are arising. And I presume that this level of consciousness is what we're trying to develop day to day um, in our um, mindfulness practice. And maybe, I'm not sure about this, maybe this is where, as it were, the secular mindfulness um, teaching more or less runs out. So, and then he talks about transcendental consciousness or objective consciousness. So um, he gives quite a, an experiential description of, of this. Um, which is quite intriguing. You might want to check it out. I won't talk about that. Um, for me, the clue in this is the language of objective consciousness. So the second consciousness, self-consciousness or subjective consciousness, this is where we, as it were, um, use the sense of self to develop the self. We are trying to apply our, as it were, egoic will to develop a continuity of awareness of, of the sense horizons. And so that sort of brings a greater sense of subjectivity to one's experience. We are aware of ourself as a subject having these experiences. So in this second level of developing self-consciousness, it also introduces a kind of egoic contortion, if I can use that language. Um, we can start to trip over our own feet. Um, am I doing this right? Oh, I got lost there again. Um, 
oh, I'm not very good at this mindfulness thing, am I? Or, oh, I'm really great at this, aren't I? That was a really great bit of awareness or, or whatever it is. We, we introduce this sort of complexity that isn't actually necessary to our experience. It's a sort of overlay. And it kind of seems to be necessary um, to some extent to go through this stage of using our sense of self to improve ourselves. But this third level of transcendental consciousness or object of consciousness is where, well, that sense of self is transcended. And so in a way, what's left is objective. I mean, if the subject has disappeared, really, there isn't an object either. But um, the way Banti talks about it is it's more objective. The whole, that more um, self-referenced experience becomes much looser, much more open and freer. And there's, we, we lose that kind of egoic contortion. We lose that egoic complexity. And something I found interesting is that Banti very clearly, despite his fondness for the path of regular steps, if you've come across that, he says very clearly that you don't have to perfect self-consciousness in order to develop a transcendental consciousness. You don't have to perfect the second level in order to develop the third level. And so this, I think, is what we are very explicitly trying to do in this mode of practice. We're trying to create the conditions for the third level of consciousness to arise, for objective consciousness to arise. And how do we do this? Um, well, this is the language of right view. We apply right view to our experience. This is what creates the conditions for a more objective consciousness to arise. So a few examples of this. Um, the language that Vajradevi often use, uses, the language of minds. So, for example, um, she won't say, oh, I'm feeling a bit lazy today. She'll say, oh, there's that can't be bothered mind. You might have heard of her can't be bothered mind. So it's not ego referencing it. It's just a quality of mind. It's a kind of quite objective quality of mind that is identified. So it's sort of made less personal in that way recognizing mind states as mind states rather than something about me. A second way that this works, I think, is by dialing back on the effort, um, a, a relaxed mode of practice, because the more effort we put in, unless, unless we've already got a fair degree of um, establishment in the third level of consciousness, I think, the more effort we put in, the more we're likely to condition the sense of self as practitioner. It's like, I'm the one who's really developing this mindfulness. I'm the one who's really concentrating hard. I'm the one who blah, blah, blah. If we can dial back on the efforts, and of course we can't dial it back to zero, but if we can dial it back far, as far as we can, whilst keeping a relaxed mode of practice going, that's really going to help the practice. So this is where the language of um, acceptance comes in, um, rather than sort of interfering and contriving. So we, we're not driven by a strong agenda. We're much more open to the arisings that happen. And that really lets us see those arisings happen as clearly as possible um, in an objective kind of way. And I think a third way that we encourage this within the practice is, again, with this right view of well, what Utejaneer calls nature. He just says it's nature. All of these arisings are just nature. It's just the way things happen. Um, and Tri Ratna would probably use the language of conditioned arising, conditioned co-production. Just seeing all of these arisings, all of the thoughts and feelings and sensations and da 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 da, just seeing it all as a big conditioned arising, a big flow of conditions. Um, yeah, conditioning each other. So, although much of the time, certainly myself, I'm 
trying to develop a basic level of, as it were, the second level is a self-awareness. We're trying to do it in a such a way as it really encourages the the seeds of the third level to come about. So we can't consciously develop transcendental consciousness, really. Um, or we can do, or at least we can't do it in the same way that we can decide to be aware of our feet, for example. But what we can do is develop awareness in a way that is really conducive to that more objective level coming in with the practice of right view. So that's all I want to say for now, if you'd like to set up a meditation.